Greetings and salutations, my history-loving mischief. Brian Guthrie, aka Guthron the Balding Bard, here with you for another discussion video. This week we were tasked with reviewing a book from the 1990s. Which book? This one. The Outrageous Idea of Christian Scholarship by George M. Marsden. I disliked the book from the outset. That doesn't mean it didn't raise some interesting questions or propose some concepts worth looking at, but for me, the book missed the mark. You see, Marsden's book argues that one's faith should play an important role in their scholarship. He also argues that the current academic world resists such faith, pushing it to the sidelines where they believe it belongs. I, for one, agree with them, but not how you might think. You see, for this historian, my faith rarely, if ever, comes up in my scholarship. If it's not a part of the historical narrative, I don't think about it. When it is, I still only think about the historical narrative part. I'm not choosing to study church or religious history, I'm studying history. If the topic of Stonewall Jackson's faith is pertinent, then speak up only in what is applicable, right? Otherwise, just be a historian or a scholar. Indeed, why insist on the label, especially when you know what controversy follows? Were Christians not instructed to live at peace with everyone in all aspects that Christians could control? Note, Christians were told that. Rather than enforcing standards and beliefs and critical approaches, to topics on others, Christians were specifically told not to do that. Yet here we are with Christian scholarship boldly walking into a room and planting their flag on already claimed soil declaring it the property of Christianity. Wait, that sounds familiar. Anyway, I for one refuse to colonize history by planting my Christian faith flag in the ground. I argued recently on my blog that Christians throughout history have ruined their testimony because so many of them charged into the mission field with a Bible in one hand and a sword in the other. My own family heritage symbolizes this, as the Guthron family crest imitates that armed missionary I just described. And yes, not all Christians were sword-toting Bible thumpers. Some came with guns. No, really, some did come without the sword. But in the larger scheme of history, those Christians remained mostly silent when atrocities were being committed. Also, just to point out, it didn't matter that some Christians stood back and called out to their warrior brethren to stop, not to the people being attacked. History is very clear that Christians dominated and pillaged most of the world, and that's how a significant portion of the world was introduced to Christianity. And they don't care when you argue, not all of us were like that. This is a crucial perspective needed when trying to wrap your brain around what Marston is arguing for here. His points about the benefits of a faith-guided scholarship may be correct, but it doesn't matter to a group of scholars from oppressed groups who now sit equally at the proverbial table and treat Christian scholars exactly as they were treated. I mean, they're just using the golden rule against Christians, right? And they really don't care about the hypocrisy in that act, and they really don't want to hear it from a Christian. Remember, Christians have spent the past 2,000 years preaching morality while failing to live up to their own standards. Again, it doesn't matter if some Christians managed it. The people sitting at the table now aren't talking about that silent group, and they equate vocal Christians today arguing against hypocrisy and discrimination toward Christians as the spiritual and possible literal descendants of the same sword-toting, morality-speaking hypocrites of yore. They don't care, and they won't, as long as Christians keep demanding equal treatment. Now, just a reminder, Marston is not necessarily arguing for Christian scholars to stand vocally protesting how they are treated by academia. But he is arguing for equal treatment, and the quality of his argument matters little when it comes to how it is perceived. This brings us back to my viewpoint on my faith and scholarship. In just about every argument Marsden made for the places where faith is better able to inform discussions on controversial or difficult topics, I was able to consider and have a potential discussion without once bringing my faith up to help. In part, Marsden is arguing that such difficult topics will never be fully explored because, without faith, scholarship and academia are both inherently hollow and unguided. I vehemently disagree with this statement considering how much Marsden's own faith argues for God's revelation acts through the natural world. Mark Edwards, reviewing Marston's piece, draws on Martin Luther's work in discussing this aspect of the argument. According to Edwards, Luther's faith argued for a God that willingly altered his infinite aspect that transcendent beyond Christian scholars like Marston insists can only be fully grasped by way of, you guessed it, Christian scholarship, in order to be perceived and understood by a finite, contextualized, historical being incapable of fathoming simply the concept of infinite. Remember, we're the beings that constantly misinterpreted the Hebrew word for instruction as discipline in ways that essentially argued for physical abuse as a means to edification. Spare the rod, spoil the child, ring any bells? In her special series from the 90s, No Two Alike, Cynthia Tobias completely completely dismantled that notion, doing nothing but correctly interpreting the original text. 
So, still think we can grasp the beyond better simply because we call ourselves Christians? Thus, it is entirely possible for a world to exist devoid of Christian scholarship and still contain the influence of a divine being that can be revealed without the help of said scholarship. Indeed, the argument that the world needs Christian scholarship borders on heretical, claiming that academia is lost without the influence of Christian leaders guiding them, or at the very least tacitly influencing them. I do believe Jesus had a few choice words for religious scholars of his time and their role in how things were going. Those leaders made a point of separating themselves from the world's academics, adhering to a strict lifestyle laid out in the Old Testament and through centuries of scholarship that influenced how they lived their lives and interpreted both history and the Torah. Marsden does not argue for this kind of separation, rather for a more integrated approach. David Keck, in discussing Marsden's review, argues against this, stating, separating the Incarnation and the Trinity from scholarship waters down the gospel message in favor of fitting into academia. As an example of how it should be done, he mentions Augustine's abandonment of his scholarly work to serve in the church. This is a nice touch, as Marsden's argument derives heavily from Augustine's writings. However, it misses one key point. Augustine was clearly called away from scholarship to work in the church. To interpret that act in any other way is to apply a retroactive interpretation that isn't there. Now, an Augustinian scholar might argue this was his intention based on his later works, but I'm not referencing that part. I'm simply pointing out that, in the example of him leaving the scholarship to go to the church, all we know is that's what he did. I think we've beat the Augustinian drum enough for today. In summation, Marston does make a compelling argument for why all points of view should be included at the table. However, it's an unnecessary argument that creates an adversarial relationship between Christian scholars and everyone else. Indeed, despite his best efforts, the entire framework for his discussion is built on an adversarial model that distorts perception in as much as the world is seen through the lenses of assumptions. His attempt is admirable. It falls short with this particular scholar for a reason not seen in the other reviews found on Marsden's work. The study of history for this historian is not dependent on Christian scholarship. Rather, the study of history with Christianity does require that scholarship, to a point. Indeed, even the concept of American Christianity or American Christian history is not a substantive Christianity, rather a bastardized version meant to create a Christianity as culture that helps people identify as Christian but does not in any way resemble true Christianity. These concepts require membership, not faith. They define a scholar as Christians rather than the scholar actually being a Christian. In short, it creates an us by creating a them, which is antithetical to the approach admonished by Jesus Christ and the apostles. Well, that wraps up this review. I will likely never touch a Marsden book again. However, I have a feeling I'll be revisiting the topic of American Christian identity as I progress in my dissertation research. And I got a new integrative approach book using psychology to help better inform the study of history. For me, that's a score. Well, the holidays are upon us, so I'll be taking a break from the video discussions. Look for some more in January, and in the meantime, feel free to check out my previous work. This is Guthron, aka Brian Guthrie, the Balding Bard, signing off. Happy holidays! Oh, by the way, I reached my extra life goal for 2022, so stay tuned for something special New Year's Eve.